Many of you have asked for films connected with the manufacturing side of our business. To do that in anything like detail would be a great task. But I would like you to have a glimpse with me of some of the main features of our wonderful factory. What do you make of this, Elaine? It's well, hey, look, I mean, the, the scaffolding look, is still sort of third world. It's timber. It's the sort of thing you still find out in India and uh, Bangladesh, you know, just amazing. And then there's a, this super modern building coming out of the piles of bricks and rubble and, say, and timber. It's extraordinary. It looks like it's sort of emerging from the jungle. <laughs> but the other thing, if you, if you, if uh, let's do Sophie did the honours. Mm. Um, but they're obviously getting part of it ready first, mm. while they're so they're doing the inside, aren't they? While they're they're still working on other bits of the outside. Because there's one that was of date this is December, and then by February, thirty-two, they're beginning to the interior is taking shape in a recognisable way. Mm -hmm. So at least part of it can be ready for production, I suppose, even while more of it is being built. Because yeah. I might think it was never finished. No, I think they were planning to enlarge it and then instead of focusing on this building, we built a different building, which was the sister building D6 Six. for the, the dry material. But the plan was originally to have a colossal factory on the site. And this, you were talking about the site being acquired in 1927, is that's that right? right? So this is one of the earlier buildings that's on the site? Year, yes, that's right. I mean, we were um, running out of space. We were in the centre of Nottingham, um, Island Street, and we had grown enormously due to the, um, the pace in which we were opening new stores. So in, in the year that D10 officially opened, we had a thousand stores. Wow. So to keep pace with the stores and the demand for the product, we needed to increase our manufacturing capacity. And so we acquired this site predominantly for manufacturing yeah. and built these enormous <laughs> yeah. factories uh, very quickly. Yeah. And also at a time of real economic hardship, yeah. they were talking about few Wall Street crash, companies investing. And here was Boots creating mm. how it described the largest pharmaceutical factory in the world is, is quite something. And uh, Elaine, you, bringing it back to the Aiton building and Derby, and is this consistent? In, I mean, in it's, it's consistent in the sense of enterprise in the face of that tumultuous time. But the scale here, yeah. and think that Boots had just got out of being involved with an American company, so it's reasserting itself as an independent British company. So it's real making this big claim for itself and just absolutely growing. And I suppose a reminder that in this country, while there was depression in parts of Britain, of the South, London and its sub suburbs, mm -hmm. were continuing to expand. So there were new markets for household products that Boots were tapping into. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Boots were very much positioning itself as this modern industry, not just in terms of its production, but also in its um, research and development. And so t the construction of this was absolutely in line with its, how it was presenting itself as this modern um, industrial force and mm. a force for good. So a lot of the design work in terms of this building is around creating this daylight factory, this yeah. modern way of working where you're reducing the heavy load of um, the, the people working in this factory would have uh, expected and, and using machinery to yeah. kind of um, replace so, uh, the burden. Really, architecture is a manifestation of your philosophy, of mm -hmm. your approach, of your values. Has that come from the American influence, perhaps, because of the Model T Ford factory processes and all of the daylight there? and the, Taylorism. Mm -hmm. I suppose a little bit. They, they, they were certainly aware of it. And they, they go back to look at America with D90 as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but... I think the the inf the influence is very much British because although we were American owned, it was very much a standalone company, mm. and so to, to all intents and purposes, most people wouldn't have really known we were American owned mm. in the UK. So I think whilst there was influence in terms of modernism and um, progressive techniques, 
I think the characteristics were very much Boots and the boot, and boot, the Boot family, John Boot in particular. I should like you to visualise the building as a vast crystal palace of industry, with walls and roof all made of glass, cool, spacious and restful to the eye. The main hall, which is about twice as long as a football ground, is surrounded by galleries, and the workers on the ground floor can look straight up to the glass roof, 70 feet above them. There are no low ceilings between them and the roof, but at intervals of about 50 yards, there are bridges linking the galleries on the two sides. So I think we ought to go soon to actually look at the building, mm -hmm. but I suppose at this stage it would be good to, to talk about um, the architect, yes. <laughs> Sir Owen Williams, by this stage. So this is a, a, a notable architect. Well, he's not an architect. He's an engineer. That's the point. He's an engineer. And that's a really important mm. differential yeah. to make here. So unlike Nora and Betty, who are at uh, Ayton Factory, mm -hmm. who are these two ladies in their 20s who were fresh out of architecture school. Williams had had his comeuppance running up against architects, working at the Dorchester Hotel in the late 1920s when his, he'd produced this really modern design for all Spruce Superior Hotel on Park Lane, only to be ousted by the company owners bringing in Curtis Green, established architect, to add classical decoration. Mm. And Williams vowed never again to work with architects. He was going oh, really? to design the building himself. Mm. And so he, he gets a, a chance with the Daily Express building. Which is a very modernist. Very modern building, where the architects had really failed to cope with the problems of huge heavy printing presses right. and expressing a modern structure. And, and he does that using glass, black glass, and B that vitrolite, and that comes in then here. He, so his work there is seen and, you know, he's brought here mm. to, to produce something that's industrial. Um, perhaps just finishing off this mm. little fascinating journey, so, uh, D6, is that no. right? No, so this is D10. Oh, this is D10. So oh, this right. was taken during the war because obviously boots were producing chemicals on behalf of the government. And, oh, wow. And so although D10 was a fairly new building at the time, it was camouflaged um, to try and disguise it from the skies. It had netting over the um, rooftops to, wow. um, again, to try and disguise that form of the building. And did the Luftwaffe ever find their way close? We to... were on their plans. It was definitely on the plans, this building. And also all the, the you know, the whole glass frontage was replaced by board, which is a wow. phenomenal yeah. job. Well, but but it never can... got hit, did it? Never got hit, no. This site never got hit, which is Can you imagine how just sort of eight years after it's been built to have been destroyed, so... So you can see, and here there's another one with the air raid shelters at the front. Um, yeah. And then also the, the we've got some cycle sheds that were used after the war, but they yeah. were built as air raid shelters. And there's still the a few of those air raid shelters that survive, is that yeah, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Wow, I had no idea that. I can't remember, because of growing up down the road, thought, the thought of... Uh, you know, anything hitting Beeston <laughs> seems unbelievable. Yes, but I mean, it's such a huge target mm. so yeah. to have survived unscathed is yeah. incredible. incredible. Mm. The first hall we enter is devoted to the storage of all kinds of material, which, as I have said, are brought from the ends of the earth to be made into medicines and drugs. We next come to the second hall, where the actual manufacture of the drugs and medicines takes place. Here we find all kinds of vats and tanks in which the raw materials are being treated and mixed. I've not really got any other words for it to begin with. You look at it on a day like today, you've got the sunlight coming through, the dappled sunlight coming through those glazed discs in the roof and it's just such an awe-inspiring space. Absolutely, it's, it's uh, the cathedral to industry really. It's, uh, you really get this sense of um, space and light in here, which are the two key elements. This is the main packing hall. It's doing the job today that it was designed to do nearly 90 years ago. 
We are now going to meet Parrish's chemical food again. This time, it is running quietly out of a series of taps into an endless chain of bottles. And Elaine, when you're looking at this space, uh, can you find a comparable uh, in terms of the, that, the nautical or ocean line? Well, I was thinking about the story, but Sophie was telling about it being launched by Lady mm -hmm. Trent breaking a bottle of perfume over oh, yeah. it as though it was an ocean line. Yeah. A, a, but instead of a bottle of champagne, of course, it was a perfume bottle. Yeah. And didn't she break it? It was done electronically. Mm -hmm. So she passed her hand through a beam and then that released the bottle. So yeah, so really? it's all about innovation and modernity. Before they are sent out, random samples are taken by the anti not only to the most minute test, to ensure that in every respect they comply with the highest standard, but also to make certain that in every case the right stuff is in the right bottle, bearing the right And place. Elaine, if you're thinking about industrial modernist buildings, where does this one, this where does it top. stand? Yeah? Yeah. Number one? Number one. Not biased by our Nottingham allegiance? Um, no, because I think because it is still in its original right. use and it's got the scale and, and you know, it is a survivor. Yeah, a rare survivor. I Very suppose. rare survivor yeah. indeed, because industrial buildings are ones the most prone to change. Yeah, of course, yeah. Well, I think we'll, we'll finish with a last look at the front, outside and just bring this whole amazing story to a close. Thank you. Well, we have come to the end of our journey. I hope I have conveyed to you something of the magic and romance of a modern scientific factory. Well, we're hoping for a rainbow just <laughs> to finish this amazing journey off. Um, this is about Women's History Month. This is why we came to, to Nottingham and Derby, why Elaine has brought this fascinating story of these two young uh, women architects and in this biblical weather, can you just tell us about why Boots was this very progressive employer with regards to women? Absolutely. I mean, for a start, you've got Florence Boots, who was one of the first female directors working for the company. And then she massively trailblazed for women in business. So we, in, in the factories, we have predominantly more women, certainly in D10 when it opened, than men. So the welfare initiatives that Boots introduced had a massive impact on women who were working here but then also opportunities in our retail side of the business. So female pharmacists, from the First World War, we had qualified nurses in our stores and services that Florence introduced for female customers, things like our libraries and our cafes, not only creating social spaces for our female customers, but new opportunities for women in retail. So you had librarians and manageresses generally were managing the cafe. So a whole range of ways in which women could be welcomed into business and supporting them through extensive training as yeah. well. And, and Elaine, do you find there's a parallel between pioneering design in, in architecture and a more progressive approach to women in the workplace? Is that something you'd... Well, I think progressive approach to everybody in the workplace, really, but the, the conditions here were were good for men and women, and yeah. and you can you I mean there's, there's a theme running through to today's um, filmmaking has been about how architecture can kind of represent the sort of progress of ide social ideas, yeah. um, branding, and, and improved conditions for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And just looking at this build, I mean, it's, no, we couldn't it's have timed this great. better, can we? We've got the blue skies, the rain has stopped. We're looking at this iconic corner of the building. What a way to end this story. And I just want to say thank you to you both so much for participating in this. Pleasure. Thank Thanks for inviting me up. How about that with the sunshine just uh, Well done everybody. God I'll you too. I'll rescue my camera now and get its picture. <laughs>